First, it's about Wi-Fi connection. So you should all, everyone should have some kind of piece of paper looking like this in their Thorlabs bags. Oops. Uh, with the Wi-Fi uh, uh, data you need to use to connect. The problem is that it's uh, individual, so it's just for one PC or uh, whatever, and not uh, uh, available anymore. So if you have, it would be very good if you could find it. We have some spare, but we I don't think we have a spare for everyone. So uh, uh, if you want uh, another one for Wi-Fi connection, you just come down to me or Amelie and uh, it will be working. Okay, and then we had a lot of questions about who is doing what today. So um, in the coffee break, here in uh, behind me, uh, uh, in the coffee break we will have uh, again some kind of list. So I want to everyone to go there and to check if they are in the right lab, if they remember which lab is it they will take. And also we have to divide the people uh, who are going to do the lab visit at Laboratoire Charles Fabry because um, with quite a couple of groups and we have to divide you up for this. And then also during our first talk session this morning, Xavier and uh, Fabiola will start to put on uh, some papers there on the wall where you can look up what kind of dinner or what uh, uh, the, th the things of dinner and uh, also uh, where did you inscribe yourself for a social day. So uh, in the coffee break you can also look this up, uh, I think outside this door on the wall, they will post it there. Okay, so today we will have a plenary talk from Giovanni Volpes, it's right? Okay, and uh, I have the pleasure to introduce to you Giovanni Volpe. He is an assistant professor at uh, the university, uh, an assistant professor and leading the group of uh, soft matter lab at the uh, uh, Department of Physics at the University of Bilkent, it's in Ankara in Turkey. And he did his postdoc uh, at the Max Planck Institute für Intel uh, Intelligente Systeme in Stuttgart, and his, his PhD in 2008 at the ICFO, the uh, Institute of Photonics in Barcelona, Spain. And his master uh, degree he received from the univers University of uh, Padova in Italy. Currently, Giovanni is working uh, with Professor Bechinger from the University of Stuttgart uh, on uh, the experimental study of active Brownian motion, uh, especially he's interested, uh, interested in the effect of thermal noise on force measurement on microscopic and nanoscopic objects. This is a collaboration with uh, the University of Arizona and the University uh, of Naples in Italy. Um, Giovanni is speaking to us today because he is also a very active member of OSA, uh, EPS and SPIE and um, he was one of the founders of the uh, uh, student chapter at the ICFO, so the Institute of Photonics in Barcelona and um, for the work uh, they did at this institute uh, uh, of uh, uh, this student chapter, they received uh, 2006 uh, an award from the OSA. It's it's uh, the award for uh, excellence uh, uh, during their first. Um, uh, this student chapter also developed the, uh, the day, what it's, um, it's the day of light, El Dia de Luz, which is still taking part, uh, taking place every year in Barcelona. Um, for his outstanding services by the, uh, uh, um, as a young professional from the OSA, OSA he's get getting a recognition today. It's also called 2012 Outstanding Service by an OSA Young Professional Volunteer recognition award. And um, Giovanni Volpe is especially interesting for us today because he's also one of the founders of the European IONS and um, was a co-organizer for the first IONS at ICFO in 2007 in um, Barcelona in Spain. So uh, welcome Giovanni Volpe.
Perfect. Well, thank you very much for the very kind introduction. I don't know how you dig out all that information, actually. <laughs> well, probably from the website, but. <laughs> well, first of all, I have to thank and uh, recognize the huge effort done by the organizers of this IONS 11 conference, which obviously has been a huge work, so it would be nice to just acknowledge their huge effort. So maybe uh, an applause for them would be nice. <laughs> so today I'm going to speak, uh, speak to you a bit about how to communicate science. Obviously, this is a quite broad subject, and uh, when I, I was thinking about what to present to you exactly, I was thinking, what does it mean how to communicate science? Which kind of science? When you write a paper for, uh, uh, to submit to a journal, when you want to present science to a general audience, what are we speaking about exactly? So before even thinking about that, let's try to find out why should you learn how to communicate science? And uh, this is going to be a kind of an interactive talk, so I expect you to answer something. And there should be a microphone somewhere. Perfect. So some uh, idea. Why do you want, I mean, you are a scientist, you are doing your PhD, you are learning lots of things, you are learning how to mount a setup or how to make a simulation. Why should you also bother you, yourself by learning how to communicate this science? It's more work for you at the end. Try to explain them what you are doing. Ah, okay, again. Because you earn your money and you get your money from government mostly, and so you uh, should uh, try to explain people what you're doing in maybe easy words. And also, you want to uh, communicate with um, other scientists and uh, exchange your knowledge. Maybe that's. That's very good. Some other reasons? You want to get the general attention of the public, like you have to s explain a complicated matter to a, like it was a five-year-old that had never l learned. That's a very good specific. point. So let's put the first one, which I think has been said. You all know this thing, publish or perish. In science, uh, if you don't publish regularly something, and this applies to PhD, to professor, to anyone, you will uh, end up uh, being sidetracked, and maybe you will lose your job. So you need to publish, so you need to communicate somehow science. Another thing, you need to, as uh, he said, you need to claim priority for your invention, and you need to disseminate knowledge. But is this all? This is another question, you're supposed to give an answer. Sometimes when you need to, to communicate, you, you find out that you don't understand why you, what you try to communicate. Mm -hmm. And so it's uh, 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 one of the, the best way to, to understand uh, what you're trying to do. That's a good point, and it goes uh, more or less in the direction I wanted to go, so it's nice. It looks like we organized it. So, you don't just have to communicate science. Communication of science is something aseptic. I can communicate science, you cannot understand anything. That's still communication, that's not good. You must communicate science effectively. What does it mean concretely? What are the advantages of that? What is the, dif these points don't say that you are communicating science effectively. These just say that you are putting out knowledge somewhere and what happens to this knowledge? In general, this knowledge should be used uh, somewhere. I mean that uh, it is uh, to ins inspire you and other people. Generally, we are communicating it to you know to so get the better results and to make a bigger progress. That's exactly where I wanted to go. So you want other people to know your work. And as you said, you want them to recognize that you are original, that that invention comes from you, and you want them to build on your discoveries. So exactly what you said. So 
in effective communication, you are trying to achieve these objectives. So it's not just set, putting out papers, but it's to get papers cited. Well, even before that, you want people to read your paper. You, I mean, yourself, you know that there are nowadays thousands of journals around, and the new ones come out every day. How many papers have you read in the last month? In the last month, I've not read any papers, sincerely, <laughs> personally. How many of you have read more than one paper in the last month? More than five papers? More than 10 papers? OK, how many of you are lying? <laughs> I mean, there is no time to read papers. So typically, what do you do? You read the title, you read the abstract, uh, you cross-read the abstract, you look at the pictures, and if you like, then maybe you put it aside to read it later. This is what really happens. So it's very important that you really get to the people, you get to the people to pick your paper out of this huge amount of knowledge, put it aside for letter reading, and when they read it, you want them to see how original you are, you want them to see how they can build on your discoveries and so on. So you have to communicate in a way that these things go inside their brains. How many of you know the concept of MEMS? A few of you, you know genes? Well, this concept of memes, or MEMS, I don't know how you pronounce that in English, is similar to genes, but for concepts. So these concepts are like genes, and they propagate, and if they're successful, they will stick inside many brains. You would like your memes from your research to be extremely successful. So, okay. Why? That's a bad uh, adding, actually. The question here, how can you communicate uh, science uh, effectively? This is wrong. That's not an effective way. So how can you communicate effectively? What's the main thing that you have to do in order to communicate effectively? To talk, hmm? especially on the conferences. Yeah. I didn't hear, sorry. I think that there is much more efficient when you present something on the conference, especially, yeah, and to talk to people directly than to just publish paper. Okay, could be very good to give a talk, but in general, but just no, think in about. In general, I mean, you should need to put uh, clear ideas, very simple, the simple, more simple the idea, more better you will be understood. For That's people. kind of true. But what is the first question whenever you are communicating your science? The first thing that you should think about, because today, obviously, I have 45 minutes, now 35 already, so I cannot tell you everything, but I want to focus on one aspect, which is probably the most important. Which is the most important thing that you should think about when you are communicating science? There is. Maybe before, it's better that you understand it very well, what you want to say. Okay. That's zero. This is the ground uh, stage. You must understand what you're speaking about. So you must know. I mean, do your research, do it well. We all assume that you know what you're doing and you're doing very great research. Um, one way, I guess, is to, to try to connect people with, what you, with your work. You want to connect to people, that's right. And so uh, you need to relate your work with uh, the life that people live. Perfect. So, I put it here, like in a zen-like way, you should be your audience. Think who is your audience. Before communicating science, you should think about who am I going to speak to. Think about this. You could be speaking with this guy that you met uh, a few days ago, so you know who he is. Alan Aspect. So, if you are communicating to him, this, this guy is who? He's a researcher. He knows research, he knows quantum, so you can tell them things in a way that uh, you will speak with a colleague. But think about this. You might have to speak with this guy. As you said at the beginning, you might ask him money, directly or indirectly, obviously. Not necessarily you go to him. So if you're speaking with him, are you going to speak the same way you speak when you speak with Alan Aspect? What changes? You have to dumb it down, that's right. But, uh, and what else changes? What are the differences of, between the two cases? You must be very simple. Must be very simple. And, but just tell me one thing. What is the difference between these two words? 
What, what is, is there a difference between the two words, these two uh, people, what they represent? This is research, this is politics, if you wish. Now, I just put another one. If you are communicating with these two, would you communicate in the same way or not? They are both politicians, you have to dumb it down for both of them. You have to keep it very simple for both of them. Is there any difference? The, it's, it's lying on the culture, so uh, you, you, must, you must think what is necessary for the France and then what is necessary for the USA. Perfect. That's exactly the idea. So, even if you are speaking with politicians, maybe one politician is interested in something, another in something else. So, this might be cultural. It's very important. Whenever you speak, we, you have to dumb it down, make it simple. The concept of simple might be different from culture to culture. Something that is simple in English, might not be so simple in another language, simply because there are some things, think about fairy tales, okay? If I have a reference to a fairy tale, this is a simple, usually. But if this is an English fairy tale, and I'm in France, good chances are that people will not understand it, okay? So, and this one, who is she? This has been actually a sensation on the internet, actually on Facebook a few days ago. This is the, this rap or whatever, uh, grandmother. So anyway, this might be your grandmother, maybe more alive and maybe she wants to know about your research. Are you going to speak to her in the same way you speak to the other? Yes or no? No. So, so basically, the. If you have to take away one concept from this talk, think about your audience is critical, so depending on the audience, you will tune your message. And uh, so let's go to an example. This is a text, I, you can quickly read it, and we we'll read it together maybe. Is the, I want you, an, I want, as soon as we finish reading it, I would like an answer from you. Is this good or bad communication? As soon as we finish reading it. Okay, so then I will ask you to raise your hands. Good communication, bad communication, and undecided. So, here the text. When fluctuating fields are confined between two surfaces, long range forces arise. A famous example is the quantum electrodynamical Casimir force that results from zero point vacuum fluctuations confined between two conducting metal plates. A thermodynamic analog is the critical Casimir force. It acts between surfaces immersed in a binary liquid mixture close to its critical point and arises from the confinement <coughs> or concentration of fluctuations within the, the thin film of fluid separating the surface. And this was a reference, obviously. Here we report the direct measurement of critical Casimir force between a single colloidal sphere and a flat silica surface immersed in a liquid in a mixture of water and 2,6 lutein near its critical point. Depending on whether the absorption preference of the sphere and the surface for water and 2,6 lutein are identical or opposite, we measure attractive or repulsive forces, respectively. Okay? I just read it quickly. How many of you think this is good communication? Hmm? Sorry? For nature is not. Yeah, because it's written for nature. This is not for nature, this is published in nature. Yeah, it, I said, I said. Okay. I just put the reference because it's the, not. It, it, this, this in nature published, mm -hmm. yeah. So it's not, it's not a good communication for nature. It's very good for PRL. Okay. <laughs> That's uh, already, but I want really to know how many of you think it's good and many think it's bad. So, how many of you think it's good? Raise your hands. You maybe influence them. <laughs> How many of you think it's bad? How many of you are undecided? No, no. It is, it is good for special journals, but not for That's exactly the point. I would have expected all of you to ask me a question. Who is the audience? You kind of went in the right direction, but who is the audience for this? Are you going to send this to your colleagues? Are you going to send this to your grandmother? Depends. So this might be good or bad for nature, but this is kind of good for a journal, so for a peer-reviewed journal where you communicate to your colleagues in your field. This is obviously very bad if you want to send it to Sarkozy or to Obama or to your grandmother. Is that okay? So, so in this case, uh, it's good uh, for a spec. Probably you will understand that. 
it's very bad if you want to get money, because here you don't really get why you should get money out of that. Your grandmother will not understand anything unless she has a PhD in physics. And uh, here, another example. I just want to, you to have a look at another example, which is in a field completely different from physics. What do you think? Is this good or bad science? Uh, good or bad communication? So this is an example, obviously, from uh, a game. So Owen Farrell will start at fly off for England in Saturday's RBS Six Nation game against Wales after Car Car Charlie Oxen failed to recover from a in finger injury. Is this good or bad? Oh, please, if you answer, could you ask for the mic? Because we are trying to record this. I haven't said before, and uh, we wanted to record all your voices. Good or bad, anyway. Yeah, if you want to say something, we will wait for you to get the microphone. Who thinks it's good? One. Who thinks it's bad? Two, three, four. Who's, who is undecided? Almost everyone else. OK, why do you think uh, it's good or bad, or are you in the unde undecided? Um, so, obviously, if you're reading this article, you obviously know it's about rugby, so you'd, I don't know, so you'd know exactly what they're talking about. There's no like jargon that you wouldn't recognize. That's you just follow it and you get all the information. Okay. Well, I would say it's neither good nor bad. I mean, yeah, uh, as you said, uh, Why? Who's, who's, who's the audience? Perfect. If the audience is right, then it's good. If the audience exactly. is not right and doesn't exactly. know anything about rugby, then of course they Perfect. have no chance of understanding. So on the sports section of the independent, this can be quite good because a sports fan can get the information he wants quite fast. If I publish this in Nature or uh, somewhere else, in a scientific journal, this will be bad. Just to iterate the concept again, is this good or bad? Okay, so I think you had time to read it. So you think it's good or bad? <coughs> By now, you should know the answer. So does anyone want to answer? So he will answer. <laughs> uh, I think it's bad. I, I don't use pounds, I use dollars, so I don't, I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, they translate that for you, actually. But that's, that could be even seen as uh, a cultural mismatch. Good or bad, we don't know. Depends on where it's published. For an economist, it might be good. For a general audience journal, it might be a bit too technical. Actually, I took it from this technical, this is the, from the technical economic page of this Boston.com. So for that, probably it's not too bad. If I publish it on Yahoo homepage, that it will be bad, because no one will ever understand anything. So here I give you another example. So in this case, you have to tell me, for this text, for what is it good? For which kind of audience? So concepts that have, concepts that have traditionally been associated with the realm of magic are now being turned into reality through science. It is no witchcraft, of course, just a very good illusion. At the Hong Kong University, it has been proposed that the right metamaterial can make one object appear like another, exactly as it happens in an illusion show. So, take this one. This text, this text would be appropriate for which kind of audience? Oh, about, I mean, we are going to cross uh, the right audience. Actually, to take it. So certainly, Alan Speck will not like it too much because he will say it's too simplistic. Fine. All of, does anyone disagree with this? Yeah. If it's not his area of expertise, that's simple enough for him. Depends on what he worked for. I, I don't, we don't know everything. That's a very about, good point. We don't know everything about physics. It's very broad, so. 
Perfect. That's a very good point. Even for scientists, sometimes to keep things simple can be useful because if it's not in your field, it makes, makes things much easier to understand. And uh, would be this something that uh, politicians uh, or would understand, in your opinion? Yes or no? Okay, so does anyone disagree with this? Does anyone think it's too difficult for politicians? <laughs> it might be, actually. <laughs> and uh, your grandmother, assuming that she's uh, as uh, alive as this one. Do you think she will understand, appreciate something out of this? No. How do you take the matter material out? Just say material? Yeah. That could be a, maybe slightly too technical for a grandmother, but still uh, she could get something out that you, with science you can do witchcraft, maybe. <laughs> Fine. Now we go to the original abstract of this work. Just read it. We propose to use transformation optics to generate a general illusion such that an arbitrary object appears to be like some other object of, your ch of our choice. This is achieved by using a remote device that can transform the scatter light outside a virtual boundary into that of the object chosen for the illusion, irrespective of the profile and direction of the incident light. This type of illusion device also enables people to see through walls. Our work extends the concept of clocking as a special form of illusion to the wider realm of illusion optics. So this is basically the same abstract, but obviously the scientific one. And at this point, we basically can imagine which is the audience of this. So do you think this would be appropriate for a researcher? For a researcher in the field, as he pointed out, yes. This is certainly wrong if you go to politicians. Can you see what is wrong for politicians here? Tell me something that you see that is clearly wrong. Politicians will not like that. The second question from the end. Well, actually, I will say the second word from the start. Oh. Transformation optics. But, yeah. Yeah, probably the only part that will understand is this. But everything else they will not understand. So most likely they will never get to this point. They will stop somewhere here. Because they will see transformation optics. OK, up to here maybe it's OK. But then this uh, scattered light, this is technical. This is very good as an abstract for PRL. Obviously, this is not for politician. I don't think anyone thinks this could be fine for a grandmother. But if someone thinks differently, you should say it now. No, I should not think differently. Say it. Grandmother's typically Assuming like she doesn't have a PhD in optics. No, no, I just, I just think that grandmother typically, in my country, in Russia, they uh, like to hear it doesn't matter what from their, from their <laughs> nonsense. They're just hearing that, and that's the point. That's the you, you might have a point there. But uh, you, you have a point there. They might want to hear you, but you would like them to understand what you're speaking about. They will listen to you even if you keep on speaking forever, just because you are speaking to them. That's true. That's also in Italy and everywhere in the world, I assume. But the point is that if uh, they don't understand anything, you are not transmitting your memes to their grandmother. So these are not, she's, not, she's not going to be able to tell this to her friends. OK? OK, so now we do a small exercise in which you, in about 100 words, write down, you have like three minutes, write down what you do in your research in a way that your grandmother can understand. OK? So it's very important. Think of your grandmother while you're writing. So I'm giving you the audience. Keep it short and do that in three minutes. What? I uh, ask, get uh, rent one from uh, your neighbors.
Okay, 30 seconds left. Okay, time is up. Does anyone want to read it? Who would like to read the, the abstract of his research written for uh, this person? We are not going to judge, just uh, read uh, one or two. Okay. Sorry, I wrote just two sentences. So. <laughs> That's fine. That's okay. more or less the sp attention span uh, of politicians. Okay. Uh, I could say that light made of, uh, made of small particles, which we named, I mean physicists named photons, these particles, however, can rotate around their own axis or around a circle <laughs> <laughs> while they are moving in the space. <laughs> Okay. So I don't just do these two sentences. That's good. I'm not going to judge anything. I just want uh, a few of you to read it. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm writing this to my grandma, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, imagine you throw a rock into a lake. Uh, there's a wave emanating from the point it hit the weight, uh, the water. Now there's a plant growing in the lake, and as the wave hits its stem, there is a second wave being formed, and this time with the plant at its center. And the two waves start overlapping, and they form a beautiful pattern. Now if you have a lot of plants in the lake, and you throw a rock right into the middle of it, uh, there's a whole uh, mess of different waves. And surprisingly, nothing gets out. I mean, waves, I mean. Now, this is extremely surprising, and we call it Anderson localization. And that's what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe uh, he wanted to... Just in front of you. Thank you. Um, new light sources made of new materials will be a part of our everyday lives because the same materials that can be used to create this light can also be used to create electricity. So the, advent the, the advantage for these is that everything we have will be flexible instead of rigid. So we can generate light and energy everywhere. Okay, as I said, we're not going to judge. They were pretty good, actually. And uh, I give you an example of some... Okay, first of all, uh, before giving you an example, I want to just give you a framework where you can uh, do these things in a more systematic way. This, actually, you can read up from Jean-Luc Dumont. Uh, maybe some of you know him. Yeah. And uh, it's quite good. So you can read this article, which is for free. So this concept comes from essentially from that article. The idea is that you have to think about getting your message across. So when you want to get your message across, you want to get your message from your brain, which is the information source, through a transmitter, which is a medium. It can be the article you write or anything else, the microphone. And you want to get this to the receiver, to your audience. And you don't just want them to listen to it, you want them to get that into their brains. You want, you want that to stick in their brains, and we want them to use it. The problem in this picture, you know which one it is? That here, is some, there is something missing. This is the communication channel. <laughs> the problem with communication channels is simply that, uh, like I'm speaking to you, the communication channel is air. If you're speaking on the phone, the communication channel will be your, the system that goes from so your cell phone to the cell phone of someone else, so there will be optical cables and so on. What, which is the big problem with all communication channels? Noise. So we will have noise. So the, the, the signal will get distorted. Of course, it's bad if the signal is weak. So if your signal is not clear, you will get the noise to be more evident than the signal itself. Here, if you look at this image for the first time, you, look, you see noise. You don't really see this part, right? Because the, the signal is weak. 
Of course, the other problem is that even if you have a very good signal, you might have a very big noise. So the, this is just to give you an image to remember. Remember, you have to tune your signal to be as powerful over the noise as possible. So this is the basic idea. How do you do that? And here I just want to give you an example. This is a text, actually a bad text, in my opinion. Tell me where is the noise here. So imagine a bouncer that is told, a bouncer is the person that is in front of the disco and prevents people from coming in, or selects them at least. Imagine a bouncer that is told to send away exactly one person from each group that wishes to enter. A, a capable bouncer will thus pick one person and then remember that no other person from the group needs to be sent away. What sounds like a trivial task for humans is very challenging when working with photons, creating a device that deterministically only reflects one single photon from an incoming pulse is still a very act active field of research with many open questions. That's a good point. Here, you don't see the connection between the first part and the second part. I, I see, but, but I'm just starting thinking about the curve about such uh, building where you work. But exactly. This that. image is incredibly complex. So this is a complex concept. It takes you a few minutes to understand it and to metabolize it. Then, you don't have a connection here. You jump from a bouncer to a photon without really a strong connection. This creates confusion in the person because like, he happened to, uh, like happened to him, you keep on thinking about the bouncer and you don't follow the rest of the conversation. What is the other problem that you see here? What's the point of this? Who cares? Do you agree? I mean, you tell me that it's a field of research, it's fine. I, obviously someone in the field might care. I shouldn't, why should I care about that? I mean, let's try to rewrite this in a more effective way, and this is one option. For a bouncer, it is hard to split up a couple, letting one in the club and sending the other away. Similarly, for physicists, it's extremely difficult to bounce rel reliably exactly one unique single photon of a lesser pulse. He says essentially the same concept, but he says it in a much more concise way, and you can really follow the concept here. Do you see that or not? One thing is still missing here, if you wish. It's not really clear why you would like to do that, but at least here it says that for physicists it's difficult to do something. So you know at least who is the person that uh, should care about it. Okay, so let's go to another example and to give a structure about how you present a concept in an effective way to a general audience at least. So first of all, you should give uh, something that everyone cares about. In this case, for example, despite medical progress, cancer is still a leading cause of death worldwide. This is something that everyone will care about, or at least your audience should care about. The second thing, you should give an appetizer. You should give a bit of context about what you are going to speak about because you cannot assume the audience knows everything that you know. This appetizer should be quite easy to understand. So in this case, chemical drugs inner, are inherent in chemotherapy. These chemicals can also harm healthy tissues. It is therefore desirable to recognize as soon as possible those patients for whom the benefits of chemotherapy outweigh the downsides. This is a concept that gives a background, but it's understandable by everyone. Is that okay? Then you say you give the main course, who did what, in this case, it's these people, but it can be yourself. Who did what? So these people did this study. And what is the implication? This is the dessert. Why should you care about that? What is the implication? In this case, as early on as, OK, in this case, the implication will be that one day it might be possible to recognize this patient that they don't respond to chemotherapy as soon as the first day, thanks to this work. Notice one thing. How much did we say about what we really do? Not much, because you just want people to listen to you. Of course, then they will ask you, and you can give them all the explanation, but it's very important that the, lot, the most part is about, first of all, to attract the audience, 
then to give a bit of context and to give the implication. N not to spend most of the time in explaining what you personally do. And just to give you another example, so in this case, it's basically the previous one. So in this case, magic lies in the beauty of a powerful illusion. This is something that everyone can relate to. So everyone can start listening to you at least. Concepts that have traditionally been associated with the realm of magic are now being turned into science. This gives the context. Then what has been done? And finally, implication. This is important. Most of you, well, even myself, it's very hard for us to say which are the implications for our research, right? Why should people care about research? So it's perfectly fine to say that. We cannot really say what a feasible practical application might be at this point. You can say that. But only five or so years ago, we would not have been ab even able to imagine that such thing could be done. In this case, it's a bit, it's, I mean, this is an extreme case. But you can always try to, if you don't know which are the implications of your science, you can say it. We could not do this. We can now do this. We hope that we will have new in something coming up in the future. This is simply, I'm putting this here because this is something that happens many times. The quest, typical question is, but my research is not really applied to anything. Finally, about the part in this everyone, you can even start with something that is completely different. In this case, this starts with, 50, I don't know how many of, this can be more related with the English speaking uh, people, but in this case, this, uh, uh, this uh, poem, it's a, a variation on a very well-known fairy tale, which is Fifi of Fifi, Fifi for fish. I smell the presence of a cuttlefish. Be it alive or be it dead, I'll find its tentacle on the seabed. This might be well the thoughts of the unnatural predator of a cuttlefish. So this could be a way in which you can, uh, I mean, when you want to attract the audience, you can do this in original ways. That's good. Do that, especially when it's a general audience. For example, in Salamanca, in the IONS conference in Salamanca, the person that won the uh, short presentations was a girl from ICFO, actually, that uh, made a poem, presented their scientific research to a scientific audience as a poem. People like that. And the ones of you that were in Salamanca know that uh, she did it pretty well. So you can do these things even with technical audiences. So here. The point is this, you have to first to attract the audience, then give the context, briefly say what you're doing or what the person you're speaking about is doing, and finally give the implication about what you're doing. Now, I think my time is up, otherwise, I would have liked to ask you to try to write your research according to this scheme. But I think it can be a good exercise for you to do maybe later. You can try to do that. And uh, you will see that uh, if you can try to do this uh, and you can try to uh, check this, how it works with other people. Just read it to other people. You will be able to communicate your research to a general audience in a much more effective way. And uh, finally, in case you are interested in trying to write some uh, scientific, uh, uh, scientific uh, uh, to learn a bit more about how to communicate scientific uh, content to a general audience, you might contact me because uh, we run this uh, journal, Optics and Photonics Focus, which is sponsored by OSA and EPS. And uh, we, are, we very much welcome new authors. And uh, the authors will go through a kind of training about how to communicate these things in an effective way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Giovanni. Uh, we will start now right away with the student <laughs> talks, if it's okay. Or do you have any questions for Giovanni? No, so far, no I one. But he will be here today, all day, I think, and so we, you can talk to him if you want to. <laughs> so our first talk is Elektra, and she will talk about perfect amplification.